Tells me we're finally recording. You got push hey. buttons. You got push like buttons three or four times around here. <laughs> Technology, isn't it grand? Uh, uh, sometimes... How's it going, everybody? Uh, I'm Patrick Goodman. I'm a freelance writer. I do a whole lot of work with Star Trek Adventures, and tonight I have got my boss, Jim. Introduce yourself. Sure thing. So, hey, hey, everybody. I'm Jim Johnson. I am the uh, project manager and line editor for the Star Trek Adventures RPG, as well as the Captain's Log solo RPG, both published by Modifius Entertainment. I've had the uh, I'm grateful to have had the fortune to be involved with the game almost from the almost from the beginning back in 2016 all the way to now. Um, I'm just excited to be here and uh, I'm grateful that Patrick that you wanted to invite me on and talk to me a little bit. So this is kind of exciting. So thank you. Yeah, I, I've. Uh... Kind of looked forward to actually, you know, getting this part of my uh, my my channel going. Actually, having yeah. you know, things to talk about. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in case uh, people are wandering in late have not been aware, the last three weeks or so have been rather eventful for the line. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and we had. Uh, well, the, the first thing I really wanted to talk about uh, is, uh, well, this guy right here, if I can actually get the buttons to cooperate. Uh, yes, yes. The yes. Federation Klingon War Tactical Campaign. Yep. That is that is a thing of beauty. I've only gotten partway through it. I got to, I, I had the privilege of talking with uh, Al Spader mm -hmm. a yeah, couple great, of nights great, ago. Great discussion. I, I watched it. I listened to it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, I'm really good stuff. You... But uh, yeah, it was it, it you know it, it was a real fun time. We actually we got some some great questions from from uh, players and non-players alike. So yeah. that was that, that was that was great. And Al is so much fun to talk to. Anyway, he's the busiest mm -hmm. man I well you're bu you're you're pretty busy, but you know, he gives you a run for your money on that. It's like, yeah, he, he he's uh, he's he's differently busy, right? Like he's. He's he's uh, he's working on STA stuff, right? Or he has he has been has been working on STA stuff. But he's also got his own games that he's working on, you know, Sentience yeah. and uh, Once Upon and a couple other ones. Uh, but then he's also got, I mean, like 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 he's got, he's got two kids, and uh, those are keeping him busy. Yeah, and, I, um, yeah. and then and he works right. He's a teacher too, right? So like he's he's doing a lot of stuff, and uh, I think I I have a lot of respect for him and, and for and for you for having multiple kids right because i i got just the one and and the one is my, a handful right and i mean he's he's oh. enjoyed it, but, uh, <laughs> i can't keep up with one much less two or three or however many yeah, I, more, I've, right? yeah. I, i've yeah. got three one one is uh one my daughter just turned 18. oh my gosh she's pretty much yeah tell me somewhere where that time went yeah um wow it did that that's been uh that's been an experience mm -hmm. uh but yeah the, the the two boys are 14 and 7 uh the the teenager may live to see 15 if he's not too reckless <laughs> <laughs> nice uh so when did when did the idea for uh the klingon war start coming about i mean i, I you know uh yeah so um this was uh gosh i need to i need to i need to think now because uh i have such a sh i have a short memory when i'm working on a book i'm super hyper focused on it and then as soon as the book is done i like forget about it and move on to the next thing and, and it just gets kind of fuzzy and i mean we've been at this for eight years now right patrick so we've got yeah. what 20 25 26 books not to mention all the digital products that we've done yeah, like, yeah I, 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 just 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 actual physical solid books There's yeah it's a lot a <laughs> I mean, it's good but it's a lot uh but um i think if i if i could remember the timeline it must have been it was during it was definitely during the height of the, of the pandemic it must have been like the fall of 21 or maybe the winter of 22 like this like january february 22 somewhere in that time frame um ivan Sorensen, who's the designer and, and creator of Part, five parsecs from home and five something of the borderlands i don't remember the i don't remember the title of the other five one le five leagues on the five on the five leagues borderlands, something. borderlands something like that yeah oh. um anyway he was working with chris birch uh, president of modifius on some stuff 
and just they got talking and they were like hey it would be really cool if we could do some sort of tactical procedural tactical tactical campaign could we adapt that for star trek maybe and and chris pointed ivan toward me and i was and I, he, and he gave me the quick pitch right ivan gave me a quick pitch on like how he thought it would kind of play out and i was like okay that's cool let's let's see if, see if we can make it work and we did the feasibility study and we thought you know budget wise and financial wise we thought it would work um and then um you know just kind of sorted out like okay how's this going to work how's it all going to come, come together and uh, at the time i was also developing um captain's log utopia planitia and lower decks right those four books all hit oh, wow. about, in, in one phase of development or another all four of those books were happening at about the same time and uh, and i had an epiphany, epiphany moment <laughs> of, of like oh i cannot do all these by myself like i, I cannot be the lead um you know person in charge of all four of these books at the same time if we, if i want to meet, have any hope of meeting my deadlines uh so that's when i finally reached out to michael dismuke to help on captain's log and that's when i reached out to al to help on uh the federation klingon war tactical campaign uh because that because i needed the help and and they had shown in that year and a half two years of time when we were all working on the uh player's guide and the game master guide that they were very good at specific things right yeah and um i thought that they would be able to do you know the assignments that i gave them and kind of like take the lead and almost be like a not so much a project manager because I, I i didn't need them to do any of the boring paperwork stuff like invoices and and uh, managing p l's and just all that crap yeah. that you got to do um but like you know i would i would get the writers for them and i would give them the writers and then the writers and i and um them we'd all work on the outlines together as we've done in the past um, and then I would kind of like lead them, let them go and say, okay, go, you know, go make the thing. And, uh, and I'm, of course, I'm available for consulting and for, and for assistance and whatever you need. Um, but I trusted them to get the job done. And, uh, fortunately I was right yeah, as a project manager, yeah. you, you're always excited when you get it right. You know, you always beat yourself up when you get it wrong, but I was excited to get it right because, uh, you know, um, Michael delivered a great captain's log game. And uh, Al delivered a great uh, tactical campaign. So yeah, ultimately, long story to your question, it was it was late twenty one, I think, when we concepted it, um, and then it started in development seriously in twenty two, and then it continued on um, from there. That's great. Well, you you put two great teams together because I you know I've, I I uh, was really blown away with with uh, Captain's Log, and I didn't think I'd be you know, too particularly into it. Uh, just because I'm an old grognard, I didn't know how this whole solo, uh, yeah, this, this whole solo thing was going to work out. Mm -hmm. But when I when I finally looked over, it's like, oh wow, yeah. Uh, and you know, the stuff that Al and his team did on on this book, mm -hmm. I see, I've only gotten part way part way through it. I've done, yeah. read through most of the character stuff, mm -hmm. and I, I'm kind of starting to get into the 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 Nitty gritty of the actual tactical campaign. I'm like, I'm mm -hmm. I'm just blown away by the 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 work that uh, Alan and and company did yeah. on the character stuff, the, the the species. Like I was talking about with Al the other night, mm -hmm. I was just I, I I thought it was, you know, you know, excellent design choices on the species. Finding you know, at least two of them arguably three with the uh me megarites but you know with, with with the enar and the arcadians being pacifists in mm -hmm. a time of war yeah i i i, I love that juxtaposition um mm -hmm. uh, it's like okay this this is some good story stuff right here mm -hmm. yeah yeah i remember the 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 team and i we had a you know uh, we were using google docs for the outline and I think the initial draft, I, I'd have to go dig it up and see if I still, if it's still out there somewhere in the, in the cloud. Um, but uh, I think we had like 10 or 12 species on the initial list. Um, a lot of them were pulled, of course, from canon, right? It, like, especially yeah. the background characters that were in um, Star Trek three and Star Trek four in the Federation council um, yeah. meetings. Like those are great places to mine for characters because they're 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 just there and you don't know where they, but, but they're interesting right you're like oh where are, they, right. where are they and i know that fasa did a bunch of them and then there was an awesome book called the um that came out it must have been the 90s when it came out it was a silver covered book called the worlds of the federation that had a lot of um uh, yeah. like sketch art in it of um all these different 
species from Star Trek, and a lot of those were pulled right out of the out of the movie stills, like like the little you know grainy black yeah. and white stills that we got. In fact, do I have a copy? I don't know where it is, but uh, Facet did um, a Star Trek three supplement and a Star Trek four supplement. Yeah, mine and are across it, the room. I know exactly. What yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and in those books are are like grainy black and white pictures of like some of the different council scenes, right? And you can just kind of like pick out those little alien species in there. It's like, oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, FASA, to their credit, um, you know, created names for a lot of these species and then just came up with some backstory for them because that's what you do when, when the, the movie itself doesn't tell you anything. Right. And if I remember right, I think Last Unicorn Games or maybe Decipher or maybe both kind of took the FASA stuff and adapted it to their versions of the games. Uh, and in some cases, the names change because I think at the time the licensor was like, "No, we don't want to call it that. We want to call it this." Um, yeah, so that's what you, get. you know, Cations became uh, Arcturans or you know, yeah, they, something like that. And like Erosions, Regulans, Erosions were called something different, and it was yeah. just a, like a, a range of different stuff, right? Um, but anyway, so we had like uh, like I intentionally wanted to do some deep cuts. And kind of like 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 pull into the 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 deep cut the fabric of Star Trek and like bring out some of these really neat species that just were never used um, other than as background dressing uh, with prosthetics and uh, yeah. you know interesting designs and stuff and and make them viable you know characters and it just worked out great that uh, you know obviously we had to cut because of page count we had to we, we couldn't put everything in obviously but yeah. we put what, what we could in there um, and I honestly you raise a great point I honestly don't remember us consciously picking two pacifist species to um to put into the war book right but i think that's just happy circumstance just the way it kind of shook out that the anr of course are pacifistic by nature and then the other well, the other ones are the areola Arcadians. or the, the Arcadians. What? Arcadians. The Arcadians. yeah yeah um so uh um i think you know it worked out great and uh, i'm just oh, yeah. i'm really happy i'm just flipping through the book i'm just really happy to see those um those movie era species being prominently displayed along with all the other species that we've created for the game uh, to date. Cause hopefully that gives um, old fans the feel good that we're pulling on the, the movie era. Right. And, and, and giving some love to that, even though you're not seeing the monster maroons quite so much. Um, I, I, they, I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. And then it gives the new fans like, Ooh, what's that thing? What, where'd that, where, what, what, what movie or TV show is that thing in? And then you can go check it out. So it, uh, it I thought, I thought it worked out pretty well. And I think what I really like about the species that we picked is uh, it's a really interesting mix of non-humanoid or you know, like non-human looking ones, right? Uh, where you've got yeah. you know a prosthetic on the face or you got some wrinkles on your face or something. It's it's really really different. And we did that with Lower Decks, the Lower Decks book, and also the um, the animated series um, supplement, right? The digital supplement. Right. Yeah. So just like last year, um, like like Lower Decks, the the animated series supplement, and then this one. That's like I think what uh, 12, 14, 16 new species or something between those three books. Easy, it just, yeah. they really just expanded the scope of what was possible with the game, and, and that just makes me excited because um, um, that just gives players more opportunities to do stuff with cool characters, and uh, it makes it even more feasible for there to be a ship of. Uh, player characters out there that like not a single one is human <laughs> right I, I i know when 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 lower decks came out you know, it's like yeah. I was, you know, because my daughter really likes lower decks i mean both mm -hmm. bo both of my older kids are, are huge prodigy fans mm -hmm. which we'll get to <laughs> uh but she she enjoys lower decks and, and i told her you 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 know the whales yeah you can play one now <laughs> mm-hmm and then mm -hmm. she made excited, excited dolphin noises. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Got the book off the shelf and ran off for, for mm -hmm. a while. It's like, okay, this is great. So yeah, I mean, she that you know that went over exceptionally well. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> that, that that went over exceptionally well, and I don't know if you, you you can't really see it now. I may bring up those pictures later, but uh, both of their characters in my first uh, first campaign. Uh, were uh, I thought I silenced you. Were uh, uh, Bronte, my daughter, she played a uh, Cation doctor, mm -hmm. and my son Sam is was playing a uh, Aurelian uh, science officer. Nice, so uh, that that was a lot of fun. Uh, mm -hmm. 
So I mean, we we we, we I, I've definitely uh, mined the older uh, this, some, like some of the older cuts. I, I I like it, but um. So Ivan came, Ivan came to to Chris and then to you about adapting it. Uh, yeah, yeah, if if I remember right, I think because because the um, and, and, you know certainly people correct me if I'm wrong, but I think five parsecs and uh, five leagues are are both procedurally generated things where you you roll on tables and you you create stuff and and then you go yeah. forth and play right, and and that basic concept, um, I guess he he sold Chris on the idea that it could be feasible for other RPGs. What could we do with it? And Chris thought, oh, I'm pretty sure it was Chris who thought it would be good for Star Trek. And then he had Ivan approach me. And then oh, Ivan yeah. did a little demo of um, of what he thought it would kind of sort of look like. And uh, I was intrigued enough. I was like, okay, I think this is feasible. And then, like I said, we went into the feasibility to see if we could even make it work. Um, and then Ivan kind of like put all of his notes together at, as kind of like a high-level outline of how it would kind of shake out. And then we took that and then we went to Al and to the other writers and said, okay, here's kind of the framework of what we want the tactical campaign to be. Go, you know, go, go forth and make it happen. And then at that point, Ivan kind of stepped back and was a consultant and, and provided some valuable feedback to the team That's over the great. course of the, of the development of it. But he wasn't directly involved in the, you know, the sausage making from the, from the get go. Cause like he that wasn't his role. His role was to pitch his, you know, yeah. his yeah. system basically. Um, and then the whole, um, the whole role playing part of it, like the the multi part campaign and the mission briefs, we kind of developed that alongside the tactical campaign component, and then it worked out that it, you know it all kind of came together into the book. And uh, Al and his team did a really good job, I think, of structuring the 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 war into three phases, and then um, and then having that tactical overlay on top of it. And what I thought was really neat, it, I don't remember us consciously talking about this during the initial development. But um, the fact that they were able to make the tactical campaign portion of it almost like a standalone game, uh, yeah. you, you could just lift that piece of it out completely and not even use any of the adventures or mission briefs that are in the book, but just use that tactical campaign by itself as a mini game. Um, I thought that was I thought that was amazing, um, getting additional utility out, out of the book beyond just the, you know, playing the tactical campaign along yeah. with the RPG stuff. Because um, I know like um, uh, Michael Dismuke, he went on a business trip a couple of weeks ago. And he had the PDF of the Federation Klingon War book, and he played it on the airplane. He told me he he played like several rounds of it, or you know he played several turns. Oh yeah, on the, on the on the airplane, and he was like he was tense throughout the whole thing because he was like, oh I had I had you know more <laughs> missions than assets, and I had to like really strategically think about how am I going to divvy these up and how am I going to succeed. And he said it was a nail biter through the whole the whole flight, <laughs> basically, yeah. which, I was, which is I thought was cool because it, it just made me imagine him sitting in his airplane. Right with his with his full down table and rolling <laughs> dice on the table, right, and taking notes as he was going, because that's just that's just, that's Michael. Like, and of course, I would I would be doing it too if I was flying. Yeah. Um, but uh, just the idea that the whole tactical campaign could be played by itself or with the um, the rest of the rest of the contents rest of the contents of the book was really cool. Um, and then yeah. even just the other day we were doing an interview and Al and I were throwing around ideas that you could pair up the tactical campaign book with captain's log right so you could do like an admiralty level turn oh. of um you could do you, you could start the war and do a turn of the war and like maybe something bad happens or like something interesting happens and then you could spin that off into a captain's log story do do your captain's log story and then go back to the tactical campaign do the next turn see how that carries the war forward and then go do another captain's log story with it if you wanted to um or go uh, right into sta right so there's a right it's just uh, now that it's out and that we're starting to see ideas coming back and forth from the fans and then from each other, we're getting some time to really dig into it. We're like, oh, man, there's so much there's so much potential here. Right. Just for storytelling wise, because we, we, we've just at this point, you know, with the with the line being seven years old, I mean, eight years old, really, to include development of it initially. Yeah, we have we have so many tools as game masters and players. Now we have so many new tools at our disposal that we didn't have before. Yeah, you, yeah. You've got like you could do the the Admiralty level campaign light version that was in the command source book, or you could do a much more deeper dive into the Admiralty campaign with the tactical campaign book. Um, and then you can do solo stories with Captain's Log, or you can do collaborative stories with Captain's Log and not have a game master. Right. Um, and then you've got all these other 
um, optional rules and tools that we threw into the uh, the tactical tactical campaign book that like changes a little bit how Starship Combat works. So if you can you can get more granular on Starship Combat, you can get more granular on using power. Um, you got more talents yeah. for players. You know, there's a ton of new stuff that we're throwing at people. And uh, I almost wonder, Patrick, like <laughs> listening to people on online as often as we do with social media and stuff. Um, I almost wonder if we've give if we've like just given them too much <laughs> in, in a short order of time. Like we we got you know Utopia Planitia, and then Lower Decks, and then Captain's Log, and now this. And it's like boom, 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 boom. We're just throwing new stuff at you every six months or so. And uh, I, I almost wonder if there's a lot of people in the fandom who just haven't been able to catch up yet. And are like still experiencing all the awesome stuff that we put into the player guide and game master guide. Yeah, that was like, three, that was like an eon ago. Even though that, those books came out like three years ago, um, there's still great nuggets of stuff in those books. That oh yeah, are now starting to add to their games, and it's like oh, but but, but look, there, wait, there's more. There's more. There's like Utopia Planitia, and there's Lower Decks, and there's this, and there's this, yeah. and uh, I don't know. So like we can see it in a different way because we we worked on the totality of everything, and we have a broader picture of it. Um, but fans are like, oh, we're still there's. I think they're still catching up, and uh, I think that's just the you know that's just the reality of the of the business, I guess. Uh, yeah, that. that's just kind of the nature of the beast. Yeah. You're 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 a little more in touch because I mean, as you, you you watch a lot of the socials as part of your job. Mm -hmm. How's the how is the you know I've mostly seen what I've mostly seen has been pretty positive. Mm -hmm. Uh, toward the, or, the, Klingon toward the, the Klingon War book. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think. Um, I mean, is is that generally correct, or am I am I missing you know a huge swath of negative stuff and having a great day of uh, avoiding? Uh, I I haven't seen a lot of negativity about it. I think because it's uh, because it's still on pre order as of us recording this session. Um, I, I, there's still a lot of people out there who are waiting for the book to come out before they before they buy it or they're waiting for the pdf by itself to go on sale right you know, at the end of march which you know i totally get um but like uh, there's been a handful of uh, reviews already there's been a handful of videos like i think bill um bill barbado the final frontiersman he posted a very positive review of it um the other day it was, and, it, uh, that, that, was, that was a good show i, I yeah i caught that when i was, I was I, i've always enjoyed bill's reviews yeah i think the only negativity that i've really seen from it is um is that you know that cadre of fans who see anything discovery and they're like yeah. the blinders come on and they're like oh it's discovery i hate it i'm not gonna even touch it and it's like really really are you, are you you're gonna do that i mean and i think i think bill put it best in his video where he said this isn't a discovery book it's a star trek adventures book right and it's like uh, bill you're absolutely 100 right on because you've really got to i mean like maybe you don't like the discovery ships that were created okay fine then just look beyond the cover you know, put put that aside, right? The, yeah. Don't look at the window dressing. Look at the content, right? The content is king, and I think the fans. If you've been following me and Star Trek Adventures for the last several years, once I took over as, uh, or once I, not, I didn't take over, once I was given the opportunity to be the project manager, um, I really pushed the content button hard, and like I, I want to put as much content into these books as humanly possible. Right. I love the artwork. Don't get me wrong, but I'm a content guy. If I could put in another 500 words of content instead of a half page piece of art i would i would toss the piece of art aside and put the content in there like i, I i'm all about the words and the and the ideas per yeah. square inch right i think right. i got that idea um it, you know it might have been eddie webb when i worked with him very very briefly at white wolf he had yep. me write an adventure for um uh, mage and and he was like i think in their style guide it was like we're we're paying you for ideas so pack as many ideas as you can possibly pack onto a page right, right. and i and I, I think that that little idea that little philosophy kind of embedded in my head i mean it was what 15 years ago or something 20 years ago and that's what i want to do with was what i've been trying to do with the star trek books and and i know you know this but uh it's like yeah the more the more the more ideas we can pack into a page i want the writers to be writing stuff that like every single sentence is an idea like that like somebody and in fact, we were riffing on this. Where we've done this before, on uh, yeah. on on the show with M Michael. Um, we would we, we there was a couple episodes where we would take just random Star Trek adventures books off the shelf, flip to a random page, pick a random sentence, and then riff a whole thing off of it, like like a story. Oh yeah, I've, I, I, right? I, I watched those. And um, I'm trying to do that with all the books, right? And um, 
for for somebody you know online to say oh the federation of Playground world book it's a discovery book i don't want anything to do with it i don't i don't need it it's like you haven't even looked at it right <laughs> it hasn't even it's not even yeah. out yet hardly and like you've got one or two reviews and you just got hearsay from everybody else talking about what it is and you're not even gonna get you're not even gonna give it a chance or at least yeah. look at the table of contents and give me a sense of it come on man i, I mean well <laughs> I was, I mean, when Disco first came out, I was a pretty vocal critic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was, you know, I was not a fan of the first season particularly. Mm -hmm. It started to grow on me as I rewatched it. Mm -hmm. It it took a few, couple, and it took some effort to get through that first half of the season. You have to kind of before it started grabbing me and showing me, oh, wait, it actually does have some ideas here that need to be explored. You had to get past the Harry Mudd episode, mm -hmm. the, the, the Harry Mudd uh, time travel episode. When it, again, to, before it started getting you know really into what it was trying to do. Mm -hmm. But it's not my very favorite, but... Mm -hmm. uh, I think anybody who knows me knows that, you know, from the beginning of season two onward, I think it has been, as a show, building on its strengths. Mm -hmm. It started figuring, you know, in season two, it started figuring out what it was. Mm -hmm. Uh uh, you know, part of that was, you know, different creative team that they're in. But if I can start to like <laughs> what's going on with, with, yeah. with Discovery, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of uh, old timers like me who need to stop, take a look at it, mm -hmm. and quit panicking, mm -hmm. for you know, for lack of a better term get you know get over it give it a shot because mm -hmm. uh there's a lot of good stuff in there mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i think you know from a role-playing perspective like even if you don't like the storyline that they're telling about you know burnham and stamets and all the other characters and the, and the discovery's specific story if you if you if you lift that off and look at what they're talking about in that moment in that in that period of time leading up to the original series there's some really interesting stuff happening there that would be amazing to adapt into a into an RPG, into a, into a campaign, right? Like like right, you know, but like just the concept of of a Starfleet officer joining Starfleet primarily for science, um, or for discovery or for exploration or whatever, and then suddenly overnight they are now at war with the Klingons, right? Like how do you how do you as a character if, you, if that's your character, like how do you make that switch, right? And can you right. make that switch? Right. And I think that was one of the most fascinating things that I was kind of thinking about as I watched the first season of Discovery is like, wow, none of these characters signed up for this. Why is Lorca acting so weird? <laughs> right. Like he's a he's a yeah. Starfleet captain. Why is he so gung ho for war? And that made me think something's not right here. And then, of course, you know, they, they revealed it over the course of the season. And I was like, oh, yeah. now it makes sense. But they um, still they still got me with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I you, yeah. you you could you could looking back, you can you can see the foreshadowing and where it was going. But they still got me with that. They mm -hmm. still got me with Michelle Yeoh. Yeah, I went, you know, because I, I I've adored Michelle Yeoh since uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so oh, and they're going oh, she's going to be in Star Trek. Great. And then they kill her. Mm -hmm. And. You know, it's oh special guest star Michelle Yeoh. Oh, it's a flashback. Mm -hmm. It's a flashback, and then it wasn't. And it's like, and oh, I'm, just there, yeah. I'm just, I'm just sitting there going, "You bastards! <laughs> you yeah, got me! You, you got yeah. me!" It's like, yeah. And I'm, I, 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 you know, that's about the time when you know when it started changing trajectory for me. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then, of course, I had the last, you know two minutes of the last episode and it's like uh, of season one it's like okay <laughs> yeah 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 and I'm, 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 I'm there <laughs> yeah and, and, I, and I'm, I'm like I don't, I don't know that I've heard anything to the contrary but I have to think that 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 last two minutes of the last episode of season one 
I think that was entirely intentional. Like, I think they were building up to that over the course of the whole season and that they were planning, you know, at, at the end of the season, this is going to be the big reveal. And that'll that'll kickstart us right into season two. Yeah. Um, which is great. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really like what Discovery was doing. I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, man, I, I love season two. Season two is so good. Oh, it's and, so solid. So solid. A lot of it is thanks to the acting. And, and it, it sure didn't hurt that Pike and Spock and Una are in that and add such a different dimension to it. And uh, the writing was so good. And, yeah. and um, I like well, the effect, that, right? you know, the special you, you, effects you, and the music are just out of this the, world. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, you know, but you know, the, the interact, the, the acting was a, a lot of what got me, mm -hmm. you know, cause Anson Mount was a revelation Yeah, uh, as, as Pike, but he bounced so good off of Doug Jones mm -hmm. and Sonequa Martin Green. Mm -hmm. It's just okay, you know. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. you know he 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 completely sold me on that, but I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm uh, I, I I'm there. So I if, if a doubter like me, mm -hmm. who was ready to, who was ready to ride off discovery two or, you know two or three times it took me several times to get through the first season mm -hmm. i finally said okay i got i gotta watch the first season through because there's another season coming up and i you know i didn't know if it was a photoshop or what but somebody had thrown that that big reveal uh up on a post of, okay i gotta see if that's real or not mm -hmm. you know, it turns out it was but yeah yeah <laughs> but uh so uh, yeah anyway, anyway so you know long story yeah. short i think um I, I want i want fans to give the the federation klingon war book a chance it's not a discovery it's not a discovery book like the series discovery book it is set in the first season of discovery because that's when the klingon federation klingon war happens but it is entirely focused on you making your own story about the war with your yeah. group of characters your ship whatever um and uh and just go forth and go and go do amazing stories with with your characters and uh, you know have the conversation with your players and make sure that everybody's on board with doing a wartime campaign because a lot of people may not want to do that yeah especially, that was... in this, especially in this current day and age of, of <laughs> yeah happening, right? Right. we get enough of that on the news maybe you don't want that in your game and that's yeah totally and then, valid you know it's, it's like i was talking about with al the other night i was really impressed with the uh lengths that were gone to to help you know the to, to help with the, the safety concerns and mm -hmm. uh to you know insulate if necessary your players from us or if you should even like you said if you should even incorporate it mm -hmm. yeah, uh absolutely. i i you know and i you know i've got to you know congratulate al on insisting on that content warning i, I yep. thought that was a I thought that was a good thing, and mm -hmm. uh, my compliments to Allison Seib for the, what she did with the uh, safety forms and and and, and that part of mm -hmm. the book. Uh, so, uh, but I, I was I was glad to see that you know as a vet, mm -hmm. if, if if nothing else, you know, I, I it doesn't bother me as much now. I don't know. It's just because I've uh, I've mellowed uh, as I've gotten older, or, or or what. But you know, I was you know that close to going to Saudi mm -hmm. in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and a bunch of my uh, bunch of guys in my unit did wind up going. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, we didn't you know have any real bad things happen with anybody that i knew personally but you know it was still you know missiles getting lobbed at us and yeah so i, I any chance to you know provide some uh, a safety net for people who might be in the, the same basic position in, in a game mm -hmm. uh where we're supposed to be having fun right so uh, you know, I uh, I told Al this so much. Tell you, I you know I appreciate that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this is 
the last big major release for this edition for first edition yeah yeah this it's, it's, this is the last hardcover book for uh for first edition and uh i think uh i i knew that at some point last year we we knew that the, that with the schedule that was coming up that's how it was going to work out and i um i think that's why i I pushed really hard to get as much of the content into it as possible because, like uh, Al and the team, like they they put they they went into the um, fortunately the the uh, SRD uh, for two D twenty came out in the course of the development of this book, yeah. And I was like, let's 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 mine that for as many cool and interesting rules that we can adapt for STA that's relevant to you know tactical combat or or wartime or whatever. Just see what you can do. And Al, you know, found the found the stealth rules and found some alternate rules and everything else. And uh, I was like, yeah, let's let's just throw it all in there and, and, and like pack it as, with as many interesting tools as we can. Because I think in the back of my head, I, I I think I pretty much knew that the um that this book would be the last one for first edition, and I wanted to do that one last push to make sure that players of first edition just got just as many tools as they could get their hands on. Um, because I, you know, obviously at that point we were already into, into development of the uh, second edition and, yeah. um, I, I wanted to make sure that we got, that we finished first edition on a really good, strong note to say, here's this awesome long multi-part campaign. Here's this awesomely cool overlay tactical campaign. And here's a whole bunch of new character rules, like, like, like character yeah. stuff, talents, species, and then more rules that you can, that you can play with. So it, it was a lot of different things packed into one book. And um, it, I don't remember cutting a lot of stuff. I think there were a few things we had to cut because of space, but I tried my best to keep as much of the manuscript in there as I could, just because I knew it would be of such high value, right? Yeah. Like, like, like for your dollar, you're getting just a ton of new rules and new options. And um, oh, the bank, the player. bank for buck, on, the, the bank for yeah. buck on this book is uh, it is remarkable. Like, see, just on the character stuff that I've I've been going mm -hmm. through. Uh, you know, I, I love what Al did with expanding the roles, giving the quick builds and things yeah. like that. Those were those that right there is gold. Just to be able yeah. to point to a new uh, a new player and say, OK, here's here's your basic idea. Mm -hmm. here, here, here's a basic template. Run with it. Yeah. But uh, the. There's what? Twenty four. Four mission briefs, mm -hmm. half a dozen, half a dozen full blown adventures. Yep. Yep. In, in, in this thing, and yeah, that's a ton. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a couple years of gaming I mean, for my group anyway. That'd be a couple of years, like, like real lifetime years of us getting, you know, meeting once a month or once every couple of weeks or something to to work through the mission briefs and to work through the full length adventures. That's a lot of yeah. That's a lot of game. <laughs> that's a lot of that's game right that, there. Not to mention you're adding the tactical overlay on top of that, right? And, and yeah, you've got you got all the you other know. you got the mini game to yeah. go along with. So I mean, right. you, you've got you know this book is like I said, the bang for for buck on this book is remarkable. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I think I think Al did a great job with. Uh, and I I don't think I I don't think I fully appreciated this until the book was in layout. But Al actually took the leap. Because the way the tactical campaign is set up, where you know if you play a mission brief or you play an adventure that's in the book, there are um, parameters like based on whether you succeed or fail at that mission or that right. adventure, um, there are benefits or penalties that you apply to the tactical campaign. And he he took a step further and and went into the discovery book, the campaign guide that we did a couple of years ago. Right. And he and he took as many of the mission briefs and adventures out of that book that he could. And then he put those into the tactical book and said, okay, if you need even more content, go find these mission briefs from this book. And here's the benefits and the penalties that you get if you play that. Oh, I haven't even gotten that far. Yeah. My so, goodness. I mean, it, was only like, it was only like two pages in, in the new book, right? But it was like the fact that he called back to that other book and tied it in to say, you know what, if you if you're doing if you want more content, use those adventures. But here's how to adapt those for use with the tactical campaign, and I thought that was brilliant. Like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't tell him to do that, and he just did it. And I was like, "That's smart," because that means we're going to get a little bit, a little bit of follow-on sales from the discovery campaign guide, and might get some people interested in that book as well. Because now you've got even more utility going both directions. And I thought, oh that yeah, was that's that's fabulous. Really smart. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll 
since we've uh, brought up that it's the uh, last hardback for first edition, let's mm -hmm. let's go by way of clever segue <laughs> to the other announcement that happened this, yeah. uh, th th this past week. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when did when did the notion that we were going to be getting second edition? first start circulating I and mean, was i mean was that a chris decision or was it uh was it just something you came up you know, you you and that you was uh talked about? I mean, was it was it imposed was it just just a long discussion uh, um no I, I i wouldn't say it was imposed like uh i mean clearly we have a very collaborative you know relationship at Modifius between me yeah. and uh and and the leadership and um I think it must have been was it 21 or 22 i think we were we were talking about like like, like somewhere during the pandemic after we after they got back to work from the pandemic after we had done the klingon book the klingon core book and after we had put the the tricorder set to bed and that that was ready to come out with the rules digest somewhere in that swirl of stuff um we were talking internally about reprinting the core book, right? The, the, the standard, uh, Star Trek core book. Uh, right. and this, this was like five, six, it must, it must've been at least five years. So 17, 18, 19, 20, it must've been 21, 22 when we were having these conversations. Um, at the time, of course, you know, printing costs have gone up. Um, paper's more expensive. Uh, paper was very dear during the pandemic. It was hard to get paper, which of all things, um, but factories were shutting down because of COVID, you know, ports were shutting down because of COVID. It was just really hard to get anything developed and right. printed and, and much less distributed. Distribution was a huge pain in the butt uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> um, like I remember, um, well, oh, it was the, I think it was the player guide and the game master guide came out during the pandemic, but it took them six months to get from the UK to America just by virtue of the, of the boats and the ports and, labor shortages and labor strikes and just all that stuff that happened it was just the perfect storm yeah. of horrible stuff that happened uh where, where like right now it's taking like you know five weeks to get from from port to port and it was taking six months it's like where are my books <laughs> like, yeah. how do we how do we get these books over here come on do i need to get, do i need to rent a helicopter and go fly to the boat and take my my container off the boat and bring it to america like do i need to do that and it's like no i just that doesn't make any sense um but anyway so um in all that swirl of discussion, we were like, well, you know, if we're going to reprint the core book, you know, do we do we think about maybe doing a refresh on it? Right. Because, of course, one of the consistent pieces of conversation that we've gotten on social media over the years from new fans, especially, is that they really liked the core book. But right. And there's always a but it was yeah. either either this thing is not well organized and it's hard to find the rules. It's it's light text on dark background. It's hard to read. It, the, we love the Elkar's design, but it's hard to find anything in the Elkar's design. The the uh, the uh, uh, the index isn't perfect. You know the table of contents isn't perfect. You know blah 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 blah. All yeah. perfectly valid reasons. But when you hear these things consistently over the course of four, five, six years, it gets you thinking. Maybe we should do a refresh of the core book, right? We did a, we did a pretty good job of the Klingon core book. You know, doing a top down rewrite, making yeah. it oriented to Klingons. And cleaning up the presentation, and also making it black text on a white background, uh, and and like the the fan feedback from the Klingon core book was really positive um, overall. Um, and then we took the same philosophy toward reskinning the core book into the Rules Digest for the original yeah. series aesthetic, right? And um, and we we did a, a top down revision again for the Rules Digest because we wanted to strip out most of the next gen content make everything focused on original series to where like you know nathan and i were nathan and i rewrote all of the examples so that we instead of them being you know a mix of next gen and ds9 and, and original series they're all yeah. original series examples now so like we, we changed all that so having those two core book experiences <laughs> uh, we're <laughs> like yeah maybe we should rethink rethink like do we just reprint the book as it is or do we do something new and so that, that conversation kind of went on for a few months and then we were like, okay, let's do a second edition or a new edition or a revised edition or something like, like what, are, what are we going to call it? We, we still had a lot of conversations about that. Um, and then it just kind of grew, grew from there. 
And we decided, yep, we're going to do this. And yep, it's going to be out in 2024 and let's go. And, and so I started developing yet another core book. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, not, not that I'm complaining, but I tell you, I've done in the last four years, I've done the Klingon core rule book, the rules digest for the tricorder set, Captain's Log, which in itself is a, is effectively a core rule book. Right. Again, and now and now second edition. So in four years, I've done four core books and you're talking over a thousand pages of content. But no, actually, it's more than that. Uh, the Klingon core was 400. The rules digest was 300. Um, uh, Captain's Log was 300 and change. And then, and then now you've got the the second edition core book. So that that's a that's just a lot of a lot of paper and that's, a lot that's of words. A whole lot of pages, yeah. That's that's well over a million words of content easily. It's got to be more. It's got to be more than a million. Um, and that's just a lot. <laughs> and like I really miss working on. That's why I had so much fun working on Utopia Planitia and Lower Decks and this Federation Klingon War book because those are supplements and the supplements are like fun, right? Like uh, you know, I don't mean to disparage any core rule book from any game system out there, right? But like if you look at D and D, all the players' guides they're kind of the same. It's the same content, right? You got your yeah. species, you got your magic, you got your weapons. Um, that's, that's a core book, right? Cause you need that basic information for everything. And so for the, for Star Trek, right. It's like, okay, Klingon, Klingon book. We were able to pack in a lot of information about Klingon lore. And then it was, um, okay, here's character generation. Here's building starships. Here's how the rules work. And then here's a whole bunch of NPCs and you know other stuff, right? So it's like yeah. that same format though was in the rules digest. That same format was in Captain's Log for the most part. And yeah. you know, probably not to surprise anybody, but that's gonna be the same format, ba same basic format for the second edition core book because that's what a core book needs, right? You have to have yeah. this stuff in the core rule book. You can't like not have character generation because then your your players are like, well, what do I do? <laughs> right? Yeah, how absolutely, I yeah. You know, how do I how do I make a character? I don't know. If it's not in the core book, then what are you gonna do? Yeah. So anyway, um I I, uh, I will go on record now and say I am officially tired of core core rule books for Star Trek. I want to <laughs> do more, I want to do more supplements. And I think that's why I get my my knickers in a twist every time someone brings up the damn Romulan core rule book because it's like I've emphasized it so many times. We're not doing another species focused core rule book. Core rule books are too expensive and too much work. To spend, yeah, they're to focus them on one species. The core, the Klingon core was a very special occasion because I'm an old grognard like you, and we like we collectively, as old grognard Star Trek fans, oh, you Star had Trek to break RPG the Klingon, fans, you had to break we, the Klingon curse. We've been cursed for 30 years to get a new Klingon core rule book out, and you know, Facet did one and it was great, and then they did a second edition, which was great, but then that was like the 80s, right. And, yeah, then it was, was... and then and then last unicorn games had the license in the late 90s and then decipher had it in the early 2000s both last unicorn and decipher talked about doing a Klingon core book never happened for for reasons yeah. um and then discovery or um, um decipher lost the license in 2003 right um something like and, that yeah and then nobody picked up the license for 14 years until until um Modifius picked it up right so like yeah. for for like 25 years we've been waiting for a Klingon core book and like I don't remember like on the old uh, Trek RPG RPG net forum and all the other forums that we used to frequent I don't remember anyone ever saying squat about a about a Romulan core rule book right it was always no. the Klingons we are now, yeah, think, we, we want our we are a yeah. Klingon book I mean I think part of it may have been because last unicorn games was able to get that box set out about the Romulans, you know, yeah. the way of Dara, which I thought was awesome. Um, maybe that appeased the Romulan fans. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but, but like for like 25 odd years, all I remember talking about was like, oh, you know, we, we got the Federation stuff down pretty solid. Where's our Klingon core book? We want the Klingon core book. And, uh, and finally, like, I, and I know Sam, uh, Sam Webb at Modifius, when, when they were the, um, the, the, the project manager, they wanted to do a Klingon core book at some point in the life of Star Trek Adventures, and then once I became the the project manager, they were like, "Yeah, we're we're doing it. Let's go. Let's go for it here." And of course, that was that was during the height. That was the height of the pandemic, right? That was 20, 2019 into twenty twenty. I mean, I, I remember so working the, on the yeah. I'm I remember, trying to remember working exactly. on the layout. I remember working on the layout during the pan the height of the pandemic because most of the people in the UK. Um, weren't working and the way the uk labor laws worked like they were still getting paid but they couldn't work because of the pandemic but but like the freelancers like me we were still cranking away on it right because we knew we right. wanted to get it out 
by the end of the year. And that's why we ended up doing kind of two versions of it, right? The the PDF that came out was a shorter page count. And then we were still madly adding content to it because we knew that the print version would be bigger and, and more comprehensive. Right. Um, but I, I lost, I, sorry, Patrick, I lost track of where I was going with this. Uh, um, we, we, were, we, were, we were both uh, lamenting how we're, Oh right, right, right. The, books and... the whole the whole Romulan thing, right? Yeah. So yeah. so so I would love to do a Romulan supplement. And in fact, I, I've talked, I've long talked about the wish list that I started creating when I started working on Star Trek Adventures in 2016, and and writing down all the stuff that me as a Star Trek gamer wanted to see at my table, but also me as a Star Trek writer. Like, what did I want to write? Yeah. What what kind of products did I want to work on? That would be really cool. I had literally no idea that I would ever become the project manager and have a little bit more pull into what we could actually do or not do. Right. Yeah. Um, but like Romulan source book right up there near the top of my list, Cardassian oh, yeah. source book up there near the top of my list, you know, Hackled um, source book right up there near the top of the list. Which one? Which one? Hackled. Hackled. That, didn't, that didn't come until later, but uh, that's always my running joke. Um, but like intelligence source book. Yeah. That's on my list independent yeah. and trader source book that's on my list these, these are all on my wish list don't, you know don't get me don't misquote me people and say that these are in development they're on my wish list and that yeah. means these are personal pet projects that i would love to see happen if i can make it work through the through the profit and loss thing and and, and getting them into development um but but to do a core rule book like i don't think fans really appreciate how much time and effort and especially money goes into developing a core rule book which is oh, a you know a significantly massive undertaking, and um, if, if for the Romulans, like like if you look at the Klingons and the um, their history with fandom, and the fact that there is an entire language built around them, and there's an actual Klingon right. language institute that you can go and learn Klingon, and there are people who who like that is their profession, right? They are professional Klingon speakers. Uh, there's there's a there's a gentleman I think I think he's in Germany. Uh, who that that is his that, that's effectively one of his jobs, right? Is he is the a professional Klingon translator, and he's gotten work with Paramount on a variety of different things. You know, he, he kind of like following in the footsteps of uh, Mark Okrand, who who developed the language in the first place, right? right? You know, and then you've got Dr. Schoen, Dr. Lawrence Schoen, who uh, uh, consulted with us on the Klingon core book, right? I mean, yeah, there is there is as far as I can tell, and you know, certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but there is nothing like that for any other species in the star trek canon um the, like there's not a romulan thing like that there's not a cardassian thing like that there's not a Vul not even a vulcan thing like that yeah. i know there's bits and pieces here and there of people who yeah. kind of stitched it together especially through some of the novels um but there's just like when you think of star trek i don't think there's another species that comes top of mind other than maybe vulcans as quickly as the klingons because the, yeah. the klingons have managed to successfully plant themselves into the into the social kind of collective um you know yeah you know just just the 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 meta that is star trek right like you think right. star trek you think kirk spock the enterprise Klingons, Klingons. you know and i think part of that's a tribute to uh how great the actors were who played uh core koloth and uh in Kang oh, yeah. in the original series because those those episodes are so memorable and like out of those 79 episodes each of them were in literally one episode, one. right? One. And and like to John be able to Cleek have that kind of play yeah, core once until yeah. they can until they until came up again in DS9. Right. right. And to Mark have that Lance kind of play Kang once. Right. Right. So I think uh there there's just not another species that even comes close to the Klingons that I would even consider hanging a core book off of, much less much less a supplement, right? But like the right. card and, and and you know, even I could make the same argument for for supplements, right? Like, you know, I know fans are saying, oh, we'd love to see a Klingon supplement or a, a Cardassian supplement or a Packlet supplement or a Dominion supplement or a, a Ferengi supplement or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, sure, that's, it could be done. But like, unfortunately, <laughs> we are not in the 80s anymore. Like, and it, it, it doesn't, it, out. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense to do 96 page paperback black and white books right nobody wants a black and white book anymore I, I think i mean certainly there are some indies out there doing in black and white books but like if you look at the 80s books they're they have a special spot in my heart of course but like that that 80s style black and white line art i think that stuff looks pretty dated at this point and i yeah. think the discerning customer in, in this day and age i think they would go for a paperback and in fact i think paperbacks are pretty viable 
um, for um, for a lot of reasons, but they got to be full color. And I think I think there's a certain standard, especially for Star Trek, that we've set with the full color um, artwork and the full color um, designs and stuff that we've done. I think doing anything in black and white would be a significant step back. Yeah. And I think I think we get we, we would get blasted online for it, even if we were able to bring the costs down because we're using black and white um, sketch work instead of uh, yeah. you know, full color deals. I, I just don't think that it's not that's not the industry anymore. I think the industry has moved on beyond that. Um, so. But then you also have to look at like just just profitability, and I, I hate to say that, but we're in a we're, we we exist in a capitalistic society, and Medifius at the end of the day is here to make money, right? Yeah. And uh, if if I make a pack led source book, you know, a couple hundred people might buy it, but that's not viable, right? I mean, I, I would right. do that as a PDF supplement if anything, because then you know it's low risk, low cost, and then I can I can throw it out there and and say right. you know there you go. And then you've got the you get you got that cadre of gamers who say, well, if it's not in print, then it doesn't exist, right? And it's like, how do you fight that, right? It's like we're in the 21st century, like embrace digital publishing, right? Accept it. It's it's here. It's not going away. I, I, th I, I think a, I think one of the things that has, has surprised me over the years is the mm -hmm. number of players that don't have much if any of an online presence yeah i mean i i don't know what the sales numbers look like but i mm -hmm. know that there's way more copies of that core book out there mm -hmm. uh, of just the original starfleet core book yeah. i know there's way more copies out there uh than our in our facebook group mm -hmm. we got not quite three thousand people in that group yep yep mike michael has registered uh i i think he said once that he, when he was looking at the stats i think last year he said he had like eighty thousand distinct impressions mm -hmm. visit visitors to yeah just a continue, distinct continue, continuing mission yeah just dis, dis, distinct uh visitors mm -hmm. which is a staggering number to me but yeah. uh actually, i i don't know how many people uh uh play the game that don't mm. that don't get online they right. wouldn't know I, they wouldn't know either of us if we passed them on the street yeah yeah uh, i think i think that's i think that's fascinating patrick um and i know i know we've talked about this before and i've talked about it with other folks at Medifius. is like it's like we know or, well we don't know but we have a good approximation of how many of those core books we've sold either in print in digital and in all the various bundles that we've done like we've done a lot of humble bundles yeah over the years we've done bundles of holding and when when you when you do a bundle and you're saying you know hey donate 20 pounds to charity and we'll give you essentially the entire line in pdf format right and it goes and sells 16 17 18 thousand bundles where gamers are buying into the line for not a lot of money right but they're getting right. everything and they're getting that core book they're happily going off with those digital things and they're not engaging online like you said and who knows who they're sharing those files with right i mean it's not up to us to say it's i mean you know it's it's wrong to do it but who's to say there's not you know a game yeah. master out there who buys the humble bundle and then sends a copy to his five buddies on in his game group or her game group their game group um, and so they're like, like, you know, we may have sold, you know, X number of books, but there's an exponential number of players who might be playing off those copies who may not have bought their own copy, but they're playing because someone else has a copy. Right. And they're just right. they're showing up to play. Right. So like, if you think, you know, if, I'm just going to throw a number out there. If, if we've sold a hundred core rule books, there could be a thousand people playing the game just based off those hundred core books. Right. I mean, right. It's just Absolutely. the, the, the it, it just expands. And, uh, I, I wish. And I've, I've talked to Michael about this. I, I wish there was some way we could reach out to those people that are just happily out there in the middle of Nowheresville, America, or Nowheresville, Canada, happily playing Star Trek Adventures at home. I wish we could reach out to them and say, like, are you like, what do you like about the game? What do you hate about the game? Give us some feedback. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear stuff. from you. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, just like 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 this this game has been out for eight years. Are you are you enjoying it? Did you try it out and then put it on the shelf? Like, what's going on? 
Um, and I, I, I'm going to assume this is true for most game companies. Like, I don't know if Wizards of the Coast has the same problem or not, right? I think there's right. a lot of D&D fans online. But I, I have to believe that there's even a bigger percentage of D&D gamers who are happily out there in the world playing the game and just not just not engaged online. I think I think that's just a. It but might they be don't a, get into the drama. Yeah, yeah, they don't they don't get into the drama, or they just say, you know what, I'm I'm happy with my group, and I'm happy with the products I buy from my local game store, and there's no other there's no reason to engage online. Like there's nothing that I need online that I don't already have in the books and with my group. You know, maybe, maybe that's it, right? Yeah, uh, and that's just fascinating, right? Because especially like you know me, I we, we lived we we grew up without the internet. And then we got the internet and it's like, oh, it's, it's super handy. And we have it every day because we've got our little devices. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I feel like I'm pretty well plugged in. And uh, but even then people are like, eh, I, I don't need to be plugged in. <laughs> it just blows my mind. It's like, how can you not want to be connected? Right. But I, right. I can see the danger of, of not wanting to be or, you know, wanting to be or not wanting to be or whatever. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's just fascinating. And I know we've gotten off the topic a little bit. We can go back to second edition if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that 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 is the uh, the the danger uh, when we yeah. uh, when we start talking. Sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah. I love this cover. Thank you. This Thank you. is beautiful. It, you know, it, it's a fantastic riff off the first season "Strange New Worlds" po poster. Yeah. But yeah. I love. I'm counting one, two. Three, three four like six different uniforms in a civilian mm -hmm. which gives me great hope because you know one, one of the things that i had an issue with with uh the standard core book as it stands what was a it was whoops wrong direction zoom in here a little bit mm -hmm. uh but it was very 24th century oriented. Right. Because I mean, that's mostly what was out. Mm -hmm. the, the, the vast bulk of the uh, canon was in the 24th century. Yeah, exactly. You had three different shows that went seven seasons each. So, I mean, you got 21 years uh, of, of, of that. But I really felt, I mean, I wrote the 23rd century stuff yeah, in, right. in the core yeah. rule book. And yeah. I, 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 and there was still stuff. You know, I wanted to do, we just didn't have the, the room for it. I wanted to do a, a section on the 22nd and, and, mm -hmm. and get Enterprise some better coverage. Yeah. We just didn't have the we just didn't have the room for it, right? So one of the things I saw in the press release is that it's a much, and the impression I get, especially with this cover. Who who painted this, by the way? I can, don't want to get this wrong. I am pretty confident it was Paolo. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to mispronounce his name, and I apologize. Uh, I think it's Paolo. Uh, Pugioni, Pugioni. Um, he's he's done some work for us on some of the other books, and I'm pretty confident. Let me let me just confirm that because I don't want to get this wrong. I want to give proper credit where credit's due. Um, yeah, well, well, me too. Because like I say, I love yep. this. You know, because I mean, you know, just just the uniforms cover a thousand years of Star Trek history. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, this this is Paolo's work, and. Um, He's like I said. He's done a lot of work for Star Trek. He's done a lot of work for Medivius in general. Plus his own. I mean, go go look him up online. He's got a lot of yeah. great art out there. And um, Ariel Orea. Ariel is our art director on Star Trek. He he joined a couple years ago, and has done a lot of work um, with me, um, wanting to level up the game on the artwork in Star Trek Adventures. You'll see it in the Discovery books. You'll see it in uh, oh, yeah. Lower Decks. Um, and in, and in this book in particular, second edition, second edition as a whole, all the products are going to like, you'll see the art has leveled up significantly. And uh, with the second edition, we were really intentional 
we were really inspired by the um the marketing stuff for strange new worlds season one because just the colors right just the brightness of colors oh yeah it was it's, yeah. um was really important to us to hit that to hit that note because strange new worlds is very vibrant very um you know hopeful coming out of that war right i mean really right. if you look, at the, look at the timeline we, we just lucked out in terms of like the federation klingon war book coming out and then second edition coming out and going with the the flavor and the and the um the inspiration from strange new worlds is it's just more vibrant more hopeful more like let's go do some cool exploring stuff well yeah and, a little, um, little, little more technical going on and... yeah yeah and and uh ariel totally bought into that and and we've applied that to as many of the art pieces as we could um and then and then pulled this the, this is our cast of characters and and we wanted in fact i think it was sam uh, looked at the initial draft of the of the cover and said we from a marketing perspective we should really try to make sure that the cover evokes as many of the other eras of play as possible how do we do that and we you know we did the confab and the huddle together and say okay how do we do that given that the the bulk of the cover is in place right the characters the ship everything else is in place how do we make this relevant to um to everything and then uh, you know i was like well let's put the let's put a easter egg in the in the art <laughs> I, I don't think i don't think it's actually in the promo art i'd have to go double check i don't all think right. it's there but there's a there's a reason there's a story reason these characters are all in these different uniforms and i was like okay so then Ariel and i put our heads together and said okay let, let's let's take our our characters and let, like let's put each one of them into a into a specific era uniform although i think we got two strange new worlds uniforms in there so you know we've made that happen yeah um but we, we we hit the monster maroons we hit enterprise we hit disco next gen and then ds9 and voyager and then we also like like you uh pointed out we included the civilian as well um because that much more strongly reflects everything we're trying to do with the core book right we're trying to bring in um more options for players and for characters than what was in that first core book and you hit it right on the mark patrick um i remember eight years ago when we were having those conversations with the rest of the group um in the chat it, it just at that at that moment in time because that was i mean if you can remember that far back not you but like if the listener yeah. can remember that far back star trek adventures was in development even before discovery came out right discovery discovery was in production when we were working on the core book but we had no idea like we weren't read into the scripts we had no idea what they were going to do with discovery we were as surprised as everybody else was when it came out in the fall of 2021 after our book already came out in august right we didn't even know yeah. discovery was hitting um so anyway um at the time all we had was the legacy series and and we just collectively as a team felt that 2371 was a really cool period of time to set stories in because there was so much happening you have the dominion yeah. war on the horizon the voyager disappeared the enterprise d got blown up around uh viridian right and and so the tagline yeah. for the whole the whole game really was starfleet needs a new crew what are you going to do right like you're yeah. you have an opportunity to create your ship create your crew go do some do some adventures and some exploring um so it, it made sense at the time for it to be set in 2371 and i think as a I, for lack of a better term a consequence of that the decision was made to go with the l cars look and feel light text on black background and really kind of focus it on that time frame yeah. which you know i don't think it was necessarily a bad idea but i think pretty rapid i mean i think it was i don't think it took long for the for the tos fans to say okay so this is a nice next gen looking book when, when are we going to get our original yeah. series book you know and I think that's a challenge for anybody picking up the Star Trek license is that you now have almost 60 years yeah, of I Star am. Trek that you have to cover. And, and you've got your super fans of each specific series or each specific era of play. Right. And you got to service all of them, but you can't make everybody happy, right? In fact, I, I'm, I'm still frustrated, mostly at myself, but just also partly at the, just the way the production schedule worked out over the years. I'm I'm frustrated that we weren't really able to give Enterprise more love because I think honestly of 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 the legacy series, I think Enterprise they got is the, the shortest one. shrift. I, I think yeah. Enterprise got the shortest shrift, but I think Enterprise is also the one era of play that is the most interesting to me because there's so much you could do with it because there's yeah. so little yeah. 
there's so little explored in canon but it's like you're on the actual absolute pushing the envelope of what's new and possible and you're out there discovering things that like i, I remember watching Evan Enterprise, I was like wow these guys this is like new every episode like they, they yeah. have no idea what they're getting into and they're, they're poking along at warp five right <laughs> on their little dinky ship <laughs> with uh with no shields 80, yeah, yeah no, no yeah. shields 80 some odd people uh ablative armor um and uh i just think that would be a really uh, that's one of my I, I haven't had an opportunity to to, to game master anything in it yet but i would love to game master a campaign in the enterprise era just because i think oh, there's yeah. so much potential there and i've got i've got an enterprise era source book on my wish list that i would love to get to i just got to figure out like how do i make it broad enough because enterprise only lasted four seasons and like when you compare enterprise to all the some of the other series there's just not enough of a fan base to really yeah to support a whole book right and it's yeah. like God, how do i make this work and so that's why we kind of like with the with the discovery campaign guide, we we provided that that um, tapestry, right? We 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 tied in Enterprise to Discovery to original series, and even in the um, you know, some of the other books, we just we tried to pull in Enterprise content. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, we'll do more of that. But uh, yeah, so I, I guess for first edition, I, I wish we had done more with Enterprise. But now here was an opportunity to do something with it. And so I wanted to make sure that we had Enterprise prominently featured on the cover, at least, to say, you know, here's here's one of the characters in an Enterprise jumpsuit, along with all the other um, yeah. all the other eras there. The, I, I, the, I, I, when I first saw this uh, back when the announcement was made earlier this week, it was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's pretty. Yeah. And, yeah. okay, Thank so we're, we're getting a... Are, are we getting? It, it says in the press release that you know you know you can have you know Starfleet officers and Klingon warriors and Romulan agents and Cardassians. Can we confirm or deny that Romulans and Cardassians and Klingons are going to be in the core book? I think that's a safe. I think that's a safe inference given the uh, press release. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I was hoping that inference was a was a good and good and solid one, but I thought I'd yeah. And I think if you take a careful look at the uh, the cast of characters in front of you, you can infer what some of the other species are as well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll, I, I, I'll, have I, some, I'll have to do some zooming in, but uh, not that I need to spell it out. But you got, you got, you got all four members of the Federation, founding founding members of the Federation there, right? right? You got, you got an Andorian, a Tellarite, a human, and a Vulcan, um, and then you've got a um, um, the the uh, Commodore in the center is a trill. And then the, uh, the character to her left no, to her, her right, our left, to her right. Um, if you zoom in closely on his eyes, you'll see that he's a betazoid. Ah. Uh, and I think that's as far as I'll go. There, there are more species than that, but uh, yeah, I think you can safely infer from the press release that, uh, Cardassians, Romulans, and Klingons are all present in the, um, in the core book cool yeah and that was absolutely intentional because uh one of my design wants from the core book was that we we and this is actually inspired by um by the decipher game um even though i know or not, i don't know it but me personally i had a lot of issues with the way it was executed but what i really liked about the discover the, the decipher version of the game is that they made they made an effort to make it more than just Starfleet, right? They yeah. had they had um, they had other species options in there that were not Starfleet. They had things for characters to do, like what were they called? Professions? Were they yeah, professions? Professions and like advanced professions or elite professions or something? Elite, yeah, professions, yeah, elite. elite professions. Yeah. Um, and so like right out of the gate with with their player's guide, you could play. A DS9 game, you could play a next gen game, you could play a Voyager game and have Starfleet characters interacting with non Starfleet characters right out of the right out of the first book, right? Right, right out of that player's guide. Right. And I, and I wanted that for Star Trek Adventures because I think at this point, we're seven years into the game. We've expanded the scope of the game so much in this time um, that I, I felt if we're going to do a core book, it's got to be representative of Star Trek and not just Strange New Worlds not just next gen not just you know discovery it's right. gotta it's gotta cover as much of it as we can pack in there 
And that's why I thought it was really important that we get a broader um, spread of species in there than what we had in the first core book. Um, so there were what? There are eight species in the first core book. There yeah. are more than that in the new in the new source book. So I'll let, I'm not going to give you any more details than that right now. But I'll let the fans speculate on that. Like uh, what 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 you know what what species do you think made it into the into the new core book? Um, I mean, obviously at this point we're seven years into uh, Star Trek Adventures. We have what probably eighty species available now. Uh, if Easy. You the ones yeah, I'd, I'd I'd have to I'd have to sit and and kind of do so, the math, but you've got. Yeah, I'd I'd say eighty is good. You, there's you know six at least seven, yeah. there's sixty or seventy in Captain's Log, and I think right. we've got most of those covered in uh, in in mainline uh, STA supplements. So yeah, so you know think think about that and uh, and then you know have fun speculating about what other species made the cut. Right, <laughs> I've already we, we we just talked about uh, what three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. Right, so you yeah. know, there's more. There's more than that. So <laughs> have fun thinking about that, and uh, and go from there. But yeah, so anyway, that was, and, and then even like the the character roles, um, we've expanded that section from the original core rule book as well. And I think um, those of you who are familiar with the um, the player guide will will get that right. I mean, you'll understand that we've expanded the scope of Star Trek Adventures over the last seven years to give more character options for Starfleet, non Starfleet, Klingon civilians other militaries etc so um we're, we're drawing on the entirety of the line obviously um right. so I, i'm probably saying too much and i think I'll uh, that's that, that's okay <laughs> I, I, the the last thing i'm going to mention is that yeah. I, I i really liked it from the release is that we finally got strange new worlds and prodigy mm -hmm. so now we've got the entire family uh under one umbrella yeah i'm really really excited about that like when when we when we when we closed the um i mean for lack of a better term when we when when uh, when paramount offered us those series and we closed the deal on that i was like oh we've, we've got all of star trek under one roof now um and, and that I hasn't really... and that hasn't happened i mean that they only barely mentioned enterprise in decipher because it was mm -hmm. an active production they had not done anything so i mean right i don't with, with the exception of fasa at, at mm -hmm. the time that they did their game mm -hmm. i don't think we've had all of star trek in, in one rpg in, in one mm -hmm. rpg last unicorn they no. they uh they, they lost the license before the the voyager book could come out right and then they did you know decipher had all their troubles and they they never quite got the uh the they, they had uh, started working on an enterprise supplement mm -hmm. uh which never you know sadly saw the light of day yeah and, because, and like because, because of the troubles <laughs> yeah yeah Enter enterprise was in i think you're right enterprise was in active production when decipher was working on their version of the game I think Decipher collapsed in 2003, and then Enterprise ended in 2004. If I if I got the timeline right, four, yeah, four or five. I can't remember exactly, like that. But, but yeah, it's um, been it's been it's been a while. But yeah, um, so I mean, Decipher had Enterprise original series, Next Gen DS9 and Voyager, and and the movies. I don't think they had the ability to use animated series stuff. I don't remember though. They they, um, they 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 didn't use the animated series in in decipher they they mm -hmm. like the the, the occasions became regulars because you saw them in the the council right. scene in star trek 4 mm -hmm. uh but they couldn't do anything with the adosians uh mm -hmm. and which is you know one of the things that you know really pleasantly surprised me when we started working on uh working on the first core book back in, in 16 was that mm -hmm. we were able to, you know, I was specifically warned away from one episode of the animated series, the slaver weapon mm -hmm. because of the, the issues 
and, and what turned out to be basically a misunderstanding because when Mr. Niven finally said, look, I gave these guys to you. <laughs> use them right. and it's like right. you know when, when they started mentioning the kazinti and picard it's like holy cow mm -hmm. there's a name i haven't heard in a while right yep and then we were able to, to put them into the books as well so yeah. um yeah it's just i, I think you're absolutely right because like after decipher folded nobody picked up the star trek rpg license for 13 14 years yeah until modifius picked it up and then by then um i like I mean, the first the first contract we had in 2016, right, didn't even mention Discovery because it hadn't even come out yet, right? Yeah, the, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that. it even been announced, let alone come out. Right, right, yeah. So, so the the fact that we have Strange New Worlds and Prodigy now, super exciting. Like I'm so thrilled, especially Prodigy. Like I, I have I have so many things on my wish list that I would like to do with Prodigy, and oh, I just got to figure out I got to figure out how to make it work because. Uh, the fact that we have like you and Al and some other people in the in the in this I don't want to I don't want to call it a stable in the writing in the writing room the SCA writing room yeah. right? we have so many educators and people with children and and like like we have the we have the know how to like maybe approach developing some sort of version of Star Trek Adventures for kids and tie it into Prodigy. And and maybe get Dr. Aaron involved in in like the science aspect and oh, teaching yeah. the science. I, I, I'd lo I'd love to get a chance to work with her. The, it would, would be, be so cool. there would be so much positive to that. But how do we make it work? Like I haven't figured that out yet. So I'm going to oh. be working on that <laughs> because now we've got Prodigy. So why not? Um, so you know, there's nothing nothing on the books yet. It's all wish list stuff. But uh, that's yeah. one of the many things I'll be thinking about in the uh, coming months and years. I think is like, oh yeah, and plus with the uh, we know that Prodigy season two is happening, right? Uh, right. They, just had, they just had a wrap party for season two. I saw the pictures on uh, Twitter, oh, yeah. Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so Prodigy season two is going to happen at some point, and we got Lower Deck season five coming, and we got Discovery season five coming, and who knows what's coming after that, right? Right. Um, at least two new series possibly in production. Um, Michelle Yeoh is going to come back with uh, the Section oh, yeah. Thirty One movie. I mean, there's yeah. so much, so much more Star Trek to come. And uh, I'm just excited to to be bringing Phase Two to life here. Like uh, we, those of you, those of you who've been around for a while, <laughs> like me and Patrick, you remember. In fact, I've got the book. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, Judy and Garfield Reeves Stevens. They wrote an, an extensive book on Star Trek Phase Two. This was the TV series back in the '70s that they were developing that morphed into the motion picture. Yeah. Right. But if you know your Star Trek lore phase two was a big piece of it and, and we informally referred to second edition as phase two um internally just because it was fun and uh you'll see some little easter eggs about that um over yeah, the course of a few that, months. That, that, that would have been even cooler to see on the uh, see on the covering of the phase two world <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that would have been cool <laughs> but uh yeah anyway so um it, it was, was there anything else in the press release that you wanted to talk about uh, no no that's uh for i think for right I know now i think we covered we, we, we've covered a lot. I've kept you a bit longer than I had intended to keep oh, you I don't on. I, don't I, want, I want to be respectful of your time, too. Like I, mean, I, I could talk all night about Star Trek. Um, well, I, I could, too, but I gotta go, I've got to go uh, get a couple of kid things taken care of, get the youngest one to bed. It's the weekend, yeah. so they get, they, they, <laughs> they get he gets a later time. Uh, yep, yeah, I hear you. Jim, it has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, I thank you. Patrick. For, I thank you for taking the time. Th appreciate you hey, coming out. Thanks for having me on your show, man. I appreciate it. You you are actually a little further along with your YouTube channel than I am because <laughs> I I haven't gotten to the point where I'm brave enough to bring on guests. I, I've just been doing my own thing, yeah. and uh, of course for the last four months I've not been doing anything with it because I've been so focused on. Uh, well, you've uh, been, you, you've had a couple of things on your plate. That's... Yeah, <laughs> I, I I I don't have that excuse. I don't have I don't have quite the workload. That... Well, you know, it's just you know we're all busy in different ways, right? Yeah. So it's uh, totally understandable. But yeah, but thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, love all the support that you've given to the line over the years, and uh, looking forward to working with you again on some I, more stuff have... here pretty soon. I I appreciate all the opportunities. I you know mm -hmm. I I've been uh, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned a lot, a lot of my work has been with characters I've been entrusted with so many. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, 
I, I, I can't thank you or Sam enough for, you know, the, the trust that you've shown in me for, you know, some of the things that I've been able to do. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I am going to bid everyone good night. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in, everybody. Yeah, everybody. Uh, thank you. Live long and prosper. Be safe. Be well. Live long and prosper, guys. Talk and, to you all soon. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll be doing this again. There's a there's a there's a new edition out, so we're gonna be doing there's it. plenty of stuff to come to talk about. So no worries. <laughs> I'm ha happy to chat more. <laughs> all right. Good all night, right, Patrick, everybody. Take care of yourself. Be well. Take care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.